Hi, this is Frank with the Narrow Gate and Wave blog. It is Saturday morning on March 21st, 2020. It's about 6 a.m. and I'm recording this blog post for you guys. So um, I really hope that this is a huge blessing for you all. Um, it certainly has been a huge blessing for me to prepare this material. So this really represents about seven years of research. So this is not something that I've just thrown together. I've really researched this and this has really been my obsession um, on my free time uh, for a long time. Uh, I really felt compelled to put everything together recently to create a recorded blog post. And um, this is the first one that I've ever done. So we'll have to wait and see how this turns out. If, uh, if it turns out well, um, I might do another one of these at some point in the future. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, today's message is called Messiah's Visitation, Searching for God's Fingerprint in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So I, I really do believe that this passage of scripture is one of the most important passages in the entire Bible. Now, whether you agree or not at the end of the presentation, that's really up to you. But I am a believer in Jesus Christ because of this passage of scripture. This is really what, in my mind, cemented my faith. And it really became the foundation of my faith as a Christian um, when I became a Christian about 25 years ago, or no, 26 years ago. So I really hope that this is a huge blessing for you all. Um, and we're just going to get started here in just one second. So let's just pray really quick and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you'd be with us, um, that you would protect us and keep us safe during this pandemic period. Um, we pray that we would get through this period stronger than ever before. We pray for our leaders, our public servants, our healthcare workers. We ask that you'd be with them, that you'd strengthen them and protect them. And we ask that you'd be with us together as we study the word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get started, I just want to ask a couple of very basic questions. What do you believe about God? And why do you believe what you believe? A lot of people hold to a particular religious tradition because they were taught it by their parents, and they're simply living out the traditions of their family. But the question is, how do we even know that those traditions are the truth when there's so many different religions out there? A lot of people cop out with this, and they say, well, there's common elements in these different religions, therefore they're all true. Well, that's just simply not the case. It's intellectually dishonest. The truth of the matter is, is these religions, they all contradict each other on some level. So it's impossible to take the position that they're all true and they all represent truth. But what if I told you that there was a way that you could actually prove that a particular belief system was the truth, not a truth, but the truth. And in the context of this presentation, I'm going to try to prove that the Bible is the truth. And I'm not going to do it based on my opinion. The Bible doesn't call for blind faith. As a matter of fact, it specifically tells us how to authenticate God's voice, how to authenticate his prophets, and how to authenticate the message that they share. It's not an opinion. It's factual. And it's very rational. Okay, so the key to discerning God's voice is found in Deuteronomy 18. We'll pick it up in verse 18. And this is God speaking to Moses. Here's what it says. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. So he's referring to the Jewish people. And he's saying that there would be a prophet that would come in the future that would be like Moses. Well, what was Moses like? Well, Moses was a deliverer, and he spoke on behalf of God, correct? Okay, let's pick this up. And I will put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So God is basically threatening the children of Israel here, basically saying that this prophet would have a message, and if you do not accept that message, that I will require it of you. 
I'm a Christian, and I firmly believe that he's referring to the gospel. So God's plan of redemption through faith in Christ. There is a scarlet thread throughout scripture, and it basically runs from Genesis chapter 3 through Revelation 22. And it basically is God's plan of redemption. God promised to redeem humanity through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. And you see that theme throughout the entire Bible. And God's saying here that if you do not accept that message, that God will reject you. But let's pick this up in verse 20. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So that's pretty harsh. We'll talk about this in the next slide, though. Picking it up in verse 21. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? So this is really what it comes down to. Is how do you discern God's voice? Pick it up in verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. So you want to know God's fingerprint? God's fingerprint is predictive Bible prophecy. He tells you that his prophets and his servants would speak the future and predict the future and they would be correct. That is how you recognize God's voice in a marketplace of many different ideas. Okay. So what we see in Deuteronomy 18 is that God's fingerprint is predictive Bible prophecy. He reveals that this is the way to authenticate his prophets and his messages to us. It's a messianic prophecy, and it was written around 1400 BC. And as you read this, what we see is that Moses speaks of a prophet that would come in the future. This prophet is the Messiah. And it says that he would have a very specific message. Now, as a Christian, I believe that it's referring to the gospel. The prophecy states that if anyone rejected the message, that God would hold them accountable. In light of what I understand about the New Testament, what this is basically saying is if you reject the gospel message, that God will reject you. That is what the New Testament teaches. Now, notice that God placed a very harsh punishment on false prophets in the Old Testament. Now, this was really done to protect the transmission of his message as the books of the Hebrew Bible were being written. God wanted to make sure that his message was not diluted or polluted by other influences. So he commanded that if a person came out and they were, they were deemed to be a false prophet, that they were to be put to death. Now, that is a situation where the needs of the many certainly outweigh the needs of the few. And it may seem harsh, but in light of God's plan of redemption, in light of eternity, it's a mercy to many, many thousands and even millions of people. Now, I argue that this is one of the most important passages in the Bible, again, because it tells us how to authenticate God's prophets and his message to us. So predictive Bible prophecy is not a sign of God's endorsement of a prophet. It's the sign of God's endorsement. So one of the best passages that can be used to support the claims in Deuteronomy 18 is found in Isaiah 46 in verses 8 through 10. So let's just read it. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God, and there is no other. For I am God, and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasures. Now, in Isaiah 46, God is basically saying that he is unique. And one of the ways that he is unique is that he alone knows the future. Plain and simple. That harmonizes with what we just read in Deuteronomy 18. So another great passage of scripture that can be used to support my premise is this. It's found in Isaiah 41. So in this passage, in this entire chapter, God is basically mocking the false gods 
that the Israelites have started to follow. This is what he says. Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forth your strong arguments, the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. Declare the things which are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. You see, God places a premium on prophecy. He tells us again and again throughout the Old Testament that only he can tell the future. And this is just one additional passage that supports what we read initially in Deuteronomy 18. So in the previous slides, we looked at a couple of passages from the Old Testament that reveal God's view of Bible prophecy. Now we're going to look at a New Testament application of this truth in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, in verses 27 through 29. So verse 29, this is what it says. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. What is Jesus doing here? Is he basically told them what would happen in the future? And he was using this prophecy as a way of strengthening their faith. That's the purpose of Bible prophecy, is that we would see these very specific predictions, and not just one or two. There's literally thousands of these predictions in the Bible. And as we look at the prediction and the eventual fulfillment, it strengthens our faith. So what have we learned up until this point? Well, we've learned that Bible prophecy can be used to prove the existence of God, and it can be used to authenticate God's prophets and the messages that God communicates through them. But it can also be used to strengthen the faith of believers. So let's expand on that. So those disciples that we just read about in John chapter 14, they spent over three years with Jesus and they saw him perform many miracles with their own eyes. But in spite of all of these miracles, we're specifically told that every one of these people either abandoned him or denied him after he was arrested. And of course, after he was crucified. But we're told in John 14 and elsewhere in the New Testament that Jesus specifically told them about his prophesied death and resurrection before these things happen to ensure that they would believe. So clearly, they needed to hear this. Why? Here's the thing. When we experience our environment, we are taking things in through our senses. And over time, these experiences, the impact of these experiences, and our memory of them begins to fade. And if we wait long enough, over time, we'll actually question how important those experiences even were in the first place. That's the way that our minds work. What Jesus was trying to do is he was trying to ground them into something more sure. He was trying to ground them in the Word of God. So these guys, based on their experiences, you know, their faith failed. But what about us? We're reading about these things over 2,000 years later, so we can choose to believe their testimony and just take it based on blind faith. But the reality is, is there's a better way of approaching this. We can look to Bible prophecy. We can look to God's prediction, and then we can look forward to when those predictions are fulfilled. And we can see that as evidence of the supernatural origin of the Bible. If you take Bible prophecy away from the Bible, what you have is just another book of religious stories. And it becomes no different than anything else. Bible prophecy the way that it's used in the Bible is unique to the Bible. And it's something that we should use, not just to strengthen our faith, but to reach out to others. Now, there was a scholar named Professor J. Barton Payne, 
And he did an exhaustive study of the Old and New Testament. And what he did is he basically cataloged all of the verses in the Bible that were predictive in nature. So at the time of the writing, they were speaking of future events. And he found that there were over 8,362 of those predictive verses in the Bible. Those verses described 1,817 specific predictions on 737 different matters or topics. He was using the King James Version of the Bible, and that version of the Bible has 31,102 verses. So we see that 26.88% of the verses in the Bible, or 27%, are predictive prophecy. So again, God states that his predictions are the sign that he would use to authenticate his prophets and his messages to us. So how should Christians view prophecy? So how did the apostles in the first century view Bible prophecy? Well, pretty simple. We can just read this in 2 Peter 1. So we'll pick it up in verse 16, and then we'll jump down to verse 19 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 19, so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. The term morning star, it's symbolic in scripture, and it's actually one of the titles of Christ. So what he's basically saying is that the prophetic word will produce faith in your heart, faith in Christ. But notice, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What Peter is saying here is that the prophetic word, the Bible, was inspired by God. By God's Holy Spirit. It wasn't just a collection of stories, but God worked and moved in these people's lives, and he influenced what they said. He directed it. So here's the thing, is Peter saw a lot of amazing things, right? But in this passage, he's actually elevating the prophetic word, Bible prophecy, above his own personal experiences. And it's true. When we see things and we experience things, we may get excited for a period of time, but over time, your memory and your conviction will start to wane. But one thing is eternal and one thing is true. There's one thing you can always go back to, and it is the Bible. And specifically, in the context here, it's speaking of predictive prophecy. Predictive prophecy, according to the Bible, again, is the number one proof. It is God's fingerprint. It is proof of his existence. And we would do well to remember this. People think in terms of using all sorts of different strategies to promote church growth. You want to promote church growth? Learn these prophecies and teach the prophecies along with the rest of the things that you're teaching. And what you will find is that your young people do not leave the church. Your old people do not slip away and fall into apostasy. You will inject a level of health and vigor in your church that you've never seen before. And that's a promise from God's word. So in Luke 24, we see how Jesus used Bible prophecy to help his disciples after the crucifixion. So we're introduced to two disciples, and in, and in this passage, we see that they're traveling from a village called Emmaus to Jerusalem, which was about seven miles away. Now, this was shortly after the crucifixion and the resurrection, and there were, there were stories going around that some of the women had seen the risen Christ, 
But these two guys were absolutely crushed. They basically put all their chips down and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But when all of these things happened and Jesus was crucified, it absolutely crushed them. So Jesus comes alongside them and it's clear from this passage that they didn't recognize him for whatever reason, they didn't recognize who he was. And it becomes very clear that they're troubled and Jesus asks them, well, what's wrong? And they're like, well, you know what? There was this man named Jesus. And he was this great prophet. We thought he was the Messiah, but he was killed. And now we're even hearing stories that he was raised from the dead. Some of the women in our group claim to have seen him. We just don't know what to make of this. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, well, you know, you guys saw all sorts of different miracles. You know, believe in him, right? No, what he does, what Jesus does is he says this. O oh, foolish men and slow in hearts who believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. So what you need to understand is that there are 1,800 different prophecies in the Old and New Testament. And most of those prophecies deal with one of two subjects. They either deal with Israel or they deal with the Messiah. So what Jesus was doing is he was taking them back to Messianic prophecies and saying, you know, this is what God said would happen. And didn't it happen exactly the way God said? Later on in the passage, they finally break. They, they stop uh, traveling and they break for a meal. And at that meal, they finally recognize Christ and what they say is, well, didn't your heart just burn in your chest when he was saying those things from Scripture? I mean, it was amazing. See, God didn't refer them back to their experiences. He referred them back to messianic prophecies that were found in the Old Testament. I strongly believe that the Apostle Paul was the greatest of all the apostles in history. After all, the Apostle Paul wrote over half of the New Testament. And if you read his writings, it's very clear that his revelation of Christ and the gospel ran far deeper than anyone else's. In one of his epistles, the Apostle Peter even admitted this. He said, you know, some of the things that Paul writes, it's really hard to understand. Paul, or uh, Peter rather, was a very humble guy, and he recognized that Paul knew more than he did. So how did Paul come to this? So Paul didn't follow Jesus around. He didn't know Jesus during Jesus' life. He received these revelations from God, but it was based on a foundation of his knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. You see, Paul wasn't like the rest of the apostles. The rest of the apostles were blue-collared workers for the most part. Paul was a scholar. The book of Acts reveals that he was taught by a rabbi named Gamaliel. Gamaliel is recognized as one of the five greatest Jewish rabbis in the history of the Jewish people. And Paul was his prized student. When the religious Jews of the first century were looking for somebody to lead the persecution of the Christians, they turned to Paul. Paul was a rising star in Judaism. What happened was, when Paul met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, Christ gave him a revelation that he was the Messiah. And Paul understood the Old Testament. Now remember back in the beginning of the presentation, I revealed that there was something that I refer to as the Scarlet Thread. The Scarlet Thread is basically God's plan of redemption, and it starts in Genesis chapter 3, and it goes throughout the entire Bible. Paul recognized that Scarlet Thread. Augustine of Hippo put it this way, in the Old Testament, you have the New Testament concealed, and in the New Testament, you have the Old Testament revealed. 
Paul understood the gospel because he understood the Old Testament. And we see here in Acts chapter 17 that he actually used the Old Testament scriptures to minister. What it says here is, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Paul used Old Testament messianic prophecies to minister to people and to bring people to faith. So I've got this friend. He's actually the pastor of the church that I attend right now. And he has this saying. What he likes to say is, you need to keep the main thing the main thing. And it's a really profound statement, really. What he's doing is he's telling people that it's really the fundamentals of our faith that really should serve as the foundation in our lives. Those are the things that are gonna steady our course from the time that we're saved until the time that we die. We need to stick to the fundamentals, the things that the Bible clearly teaches. There's many people that are out there and what they do is they run after the next new revelation or the next move of the spirit or, you know, signs and wonders and this and that. They're dazzled by these things. But I'm going to tell you that those are the people that usually drift off into error and into heresy. What we need to do is we need to stick to the fundamentals of our Christian faith. And I would argue that Bible prophecy is part of that foundation. Now, in the book of Revelation, there is a passage in uh, chapter 19, verse 10. At the end of that verse, an angel makes a statement to John, the apostle, and he says this, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's a really profound statement. What does that mean? Well, remember, I was telling you about the crimson thread it's really a prophetic crimson thread that runs through the Bible from Genesis chapter 3 through Revelation 22. And what it reveals is God's plan of redemption through the Messiah. It teaches us about salvation by faith through grace in the biblical Christ, and it teaches us the biblical gospel. It reveals it throughout the scripture. Remember I said before, Augustine of Hippo put it this way. In the Old Testament, you have the New Testament concealed, and in the New Testament, you have the Old Testament revealed. God revealed the gospel in advance in the Old Testament. And what he did is he gave us breadcrumbs throughout the Old Testament, and he gave us bits of information here and there about the Messiah, where he would be born, the nature of his birth, what he would be like, what he would do, how he would die. All of these things. Why did he do it? He did it so that we would recognize him when he came. That's the bottom line. So the reality is you cannot separate predictive Bible prophecy, especially not the messianic verses. You can't separate those from the gospel. They go hand in hand. The fact of the matter is if you don't have those predictive Bible prophecies, you don't really know whether or not the Jesus that we are worshiping in the New Testament is the true Messiah. Because if he didn't fulfill those prophecies, he can't be the Messiah. And that's the bottom line. So again, there's about 1,800 predictive Bible prophecies in the Old and New Testament. The majority of these prophecies either deal with Israel or Israel's Messiah. Now, there's really two types of messianic prophecies that are found in the Bible, and on the surface, they seem to contradict each other. So really, for thousands of years, Jews haven't believed that there would be just one Messiah, but they believe that there might that there would be at least two, if not more, Messiahs. So the first category of prophecies are sometimes referred to as the Son of David prophecies. They depict the Messiah to be like David. David was the greatest king in Israel's history. These prophecies depict the Messiah as a conquering king. He'd be a warrior that would come to deliver the Jews from Gentile oppression. Now let's just face it. There's been no people group in history that's been hated more and persecuted more than the Jews. They've been looking for a deliverer for thousands of years to deliver them from oppression. 
The scriptures predict that he would come and conquer the entire earth and right all wrongs and bring peace through force, that he would rule and reign from Jerusalem and bring the earth back to the condition that it was prior to the fall that happened in the Garden of Eden. Now, the son of Joseph prophecies paint a different picture of the Messiah, and in some ways they seem to contradict it. So the son of Joseph prophecies reveal the Messiah as a suffering servant, and in some passages they even reveal that he would suffer and die for the sins of the people. So how can you reconcile these two things? How can one person fulfill both sets of prophecies? It's because the Bible reveals that the Messiah wouldn't just come once, he would actually come twice. He had come the first time as a suffering servant to die for the sins of the people and to bring peace between humanity and God. And then it reveals that he would return again later as the son of David and that he would come to take the world back from the usurpers and to bring peace to the world and to set up a kingdom. Now, the Jewish people couldn't reconcile how one man could fit both redemptive roles, but the Bible clearly reveals that this is the case. Now, this is what's interesting, is every son of Joseph prophecy was fulfilled literally. With that being the case, why wouldn't the son of David prophecies be fulfilled literally as well? The reality is, is Jesus came once to die for our sins, and he'll come back again to right all wrongs. And this book of Daniel prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, reveals his first coming and reveals what would happen just prior to his second coming. So in the first 14 slides of this presentation, I laid a foundation and revealed what the Bible has to say about predictive Bible prophecy and why it's so important. So I'm not going to say anything more about that at this point. We're going to transition into part two of the presentation, and we're going to look at Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Again, I believe that this is one of the most important prophecies in the entire Bible, because what it does is it basically reveals God's prophetic timeline for how he would deal with the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem, and it even reveals information about the first coming of the Messiah and what the state of the world would be like just prior to his return. So before we can dive into this prophecy, we need to set a context. And I am going to warn you ahead of time, this is going to be complicated. There's a reason why so many people have misinterpreted this passage. It's because they were careless and they didn't check their work. So again, before we jump in, we'll set the context right now. So what we find is that the prophet Daniel received this revelation in his 80s near the end of the Babylonian captivity. About 70 years earlier, Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. So this happened around 606 BC. Most of the people that survived the siege were taken as slaves and spread throughout the Babylonian empire. Now, Daniel was just a boy, but he was identified as having an exceptional intellect as a child, and he was groomed to become a magi in the king's court. So the book of Daniel reveals that there were actually three other boys that were selected to be magi. So uh, these boys were named Sh uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were actually the Babylonian names that they had received. Now in uh, 586 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple after a brief period of rebellion. So initially when they took the city, they didn't completely demolish it. But the Jews rebelled eventually, and as punishment, they destroyed the city and the temple. Now, before the captivity started, the Jewish nation had drifted away from God, and for years God had sent prophet after prophet, and he pleaded with them to repent and to return to him, but they didn't. They rejected these warnings and persecuted the prophets. In some cases, they even killed the prophets. Now, finally, God brought the Babylonians to conquer and enslave the Judean people as punishment for their disobedience. So God even warned them back in Exodus that if they ever committed the same sins as the Canaanites, 
that God would remove them from the land. And that's exactly what happened. They were specifically removed for the sins of idolatry, child sacrifice, and ritual prostitution. And when I say child sacrifice, what I mean is that they actually took babies and burned them alive. And they offered them to gods and goddesses in payment for prosperity. It's just sick what they did. There was a reason why God removed the Jews from the land. In chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, Dan, Daniel recognized that the captivity was nearing its end. So he was reading through the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah revealed before the Babylonian captivity started that Babylon would conquer the Jewish people and that they would be in captivity for exactly 70 years. So he recognized that the captivity was nearing its end. He didn't understand how God was going to change their, their fortunes, but he knew that it was going to happen and it was going to happen soon. So he started to fast and pray. He was praying for forgiveness for his own sins and for the sins of the nation. And what we learned is that an angel appeared and gave this particular prophecy to Daniel. So Daniel didn't receive the answer that he was seeking. God gave him a different answer, but arguably gave him the most important revelation in the entire Bible. Now, the prophecy provided Daniel with God's prophetic timetable for God's dealing with the Hebrew people and the city of Jerusalem. And of particular interest, in verses 24 through 27, it accurately predicts the date of the Messiah's arrival or visitation. So in the Old Testament, there are several different passages of Scripture that reveal exactly how Messiah would reveal himself to the nation of Israel. Now, instead of actually looking at all of those different prophecies, I'm just going to point you to Luke 19. Jesus had been to Jerusalem many times in his life and several times in his ministry. But in Luke 19, this particular visit was different from all the rest. And you'll see the prophetic significance in this passage. So this is what he said. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. So he was approaching Jerusalem and he was approaching the eastern gate of the city. And he was riding on a donkey in fulfillment to what the prophet said in the Old Testament. And this is what he said. If you had only known in this day even you, the things which make for peace. But now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? This is the whole point. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Again, this was not a regular visit to Jerusalem. This particular time when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, he was fulfilling multiple prophecies in the Old Testament. And he was also speaking something of prophetic significance. He revealed something that we will talk about in a couple of slides when we actually go through Daniel's prophecy. These details here correlate and harmonize with what Daniel predicted over 500 years earlier. So let's pick this up in verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. So this is referring to the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. Now, what we'll see is God had six things that he was going to accomplish during the time of this decree. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sin. Number three, to make atonement for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up vision and prophecy. And finally, number six, to anoint the most holy place. So these things have not been fulfilled, not all of them. Some of them will be fulfilled in the future. Picking it up in verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So what is this, what is this saying? 
Well, what we know from history is that the Jewish temple and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed in 586 BC. And we know that there are three different decrees that are related to these things, okay? The first decree was from Cyrus. So after the Babylonian exile ended, Cyrus made a command or a decree to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. He sent people there along with resources, but it never happened. The people took those resources and built homes for themselves instead of the temple. They didn't see a point to rebuilding the temple. Later on, Artaxerxes came around and he became king. And when he became king, he set out a, a, a very similar decree to rebuild the temple. Now this time it happened, so you can read about that in the book of Ezra. Now the third decree didn't deal with the temples, it dealt with the city, because the city was still in ruins. Now we can read about this decree in the book of Nehemiah, and this decree specifically happened in Nehemiah chapter two. So from that decree, a period of quote unquote 69 weeks would elapse and then Messiah would arrive. And that is what this passage is saying. Now it goes on to say, and it will be rebuilt again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. So again, you can read about Nehemiah's struggles to rebuild the city of Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. Verse 26, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. So what this is saying in the original Hebrew is that after this period of time elapses, Messiah would come, he would present himself, and then he would be killed. And then after he was killed, the quote-unquote people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So what is it talking about here? Well, we know from history that in 66 AD, the Jews rebelled against the Romans. And when that happened, it took the Romans a few years to quell the rebellion, but they absolutely crushed the rebellion in 70 AD. And in the process, they killed nearly a million men, women, and children in Jerusalem and in the surrounding region. And they also destroyed the temple and the city. Now, what does it say here? And its end will come in a flood. Even to the end, there will be wars, desolations are determined. So what this is saying is God not only made the temple desolate, but he made the city desolate, and he made the nation desolate. So it's really chilling when you see that Jesus spoke these very same things in Luke chapter 19, and what Jesus said harmonized with this perfectly. Jesus approached Jerusalem and knew that he would be rejected, and that the punishment for rejecting the peace that he offered them was that the city would be destroyed, the nation would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, and many of the people would be destroyed. That is what Jesus was lamenting about. He came specifically to die for the sins of the people. He was stressed about what would happen to the people who rejected him. Now the question, there's a couple of questions that we need to answer. We need to understand what Daniel meant by weeks, and we need to understand um, something about the decree. We need to know when that decree was made. And then, once we know the decree and we understand the duration of time that was being referred to, we should be able to count down and determine when the Bible predicted that Messiah would present himself to the nation. Now, you have to keep in mind that this passage wasn't written in English or whatever language you read when you read your Bible translation. It was recorded in Hebrew. And the Hebrew word that's translated as weeks in an English Bible is a word um, that's pronounced Shavua. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. If you're Jewish, please forgive me <laughs> for destroying this word. But that word doesn't mean weeks. It means sevens. It's kind of like in English, the word dozen. You can have 12 maids of milking or, you know, like in the Christmas carol, um, 12 is a dozen. You can have a dozen eggs or a dozen years or a dozen football teams, you know, whatever. A dozen means 12. In the same way, Shavuah means seven. In scripture, it's used a number of different ways. In Genesis 2 and Exodus 20, 
we see this word used in terms of weeks of days or seven days. In Leviticus 23, we see it used in, in the context of weeks of weeks or seven weeks or 49 days. It can also be used as weeks of months. We see this in Exodus 12. We see this in Leviticus 23, um, weeks of months or seven months. And it can also be used as weeks of years. Now, this is in the context of um, something in the Old Testament called the Sabbath of the land, and it is all over the Old Testament. This weeks of years, or the Sabbath of the land, is integral to understanding why the Jews were even in the Babylonian captivity. So the context here actually demands that we interpret these weeks as weeks of biblical years. So if you look at Leviticus 25 verses 2 through 4, it basically describes the Sabbath of the land. So you have a Sabbath, you know, for people, they work six days and they're off on the seventh. Well, the same thing was supposed to be used um, for the land. You work the land, you plant your crops, you harvest your vineyards for six years. And then on the seventh year, it's supposed to rest. You know, they didn't have modern agricultural science. They didn't have the great fertilizers that we do. The land would get depleted. So what, so what God was commanding is that you let the land rest so that the land can basically gather its strength back and the land will produce strong crops for you. That's what he commanded. The problem is the Jews didn't obey that commandment. And in fact, um, from the time that it was given, the Jews disobeyed the commandment in Judea 70 cycles in a row. So for 490 years, they disobeyed this commandment. Now, if you look at Jeremiah 25, it tells us specifically that the king of Babylon would basically conquer them and that the Jewish people would be enslaved for a period of 70 years. Now, Leviticus uh, chapters 25 and 26 predict the duration of the future Babylonian exile. So again, the book of Leviticus was written by Moses. It wasn't written by, you know, Nehemiah or, you know, Daniel or any of these contemporary prophets that lived, you know, around that time of the Babylonian captivity or shortly after. This was actually written, you know, around 1450 B.C., so what does it say? You, however, I will scatter among the nations, and I will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. The land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation. While you are in your enemy's land, then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. So what he's saying here is, you know what? At some point in the future, I'm going to take the land that I gave to you away from you just for a little bit. It's going to be a punishment. And during that time, when you're away, the land will be allowed to rest. And it will rest for 70 years. That's what we saw later in the book of Jeremiah. All right. So in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, God promises to deal with the Hebrews in his decree. His decree was to accomplish you know, those six different things that we talked about previously just a few slides ago. But he says that it would happen over a period of 70 weeks. And in the context, it's referring to weeks of biblical years or 490 years. So one year of God's decree for every one year of disobedience. Now you can go back and you can read through all those scriptures and you can study this out yourself and I'm confident that you'll come to the same conclusion that I just did. Okay? So where does this lead us? Well, this passage or this prophecy tells us a few things. The 70 weeks would start sometime in the future on the very day of a specific decree. This decree would be to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, not the temple. As I said before, there were two other decrees that are recorded in the Bible, one from Cyrus and one from Artaxerxes, and they both 
were about rebuilding the temple. But the third decree that we find in the Bible after the Babylonian captivity was a decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now, from this starting point, the day of that decree, Daniel tells us that Messiah would appear 69 weeks of biblical years after this decree. So, you know, I'm not torturing this passage. I am basically following what the passage specifically says, okay? Word for word. So, if we have 69 weeks of biblical years, how many days is that? Well, if you look through the Bible, you'll find that the Bible says that a year is 360 days. There's 12 months, and the Bible records those months as being 30 days. Now, I'm not going to bother going through this. Google it, and you'll find out what I'm saying is true. All right, the modern Jewish calendar is a little bit different, but that's the way that they did things during biblical times. All right. So one week of biblical years is calculated this way, 360 days per year, and you have seven years. Multiply 360 by seven, you get 2,520 days. Okay, math is boring, I get it. Um, but let's just, let's just, please just stick with me a little bit longer. We'll get through the math here. Now the duration of the 69 weeks of biblical years is calculated this way. So if one week of biblical year one week of biblical years is 2,520 days. Just multiply that by 69 and you get 173,880 days. So from the time of the decree, you count 173,880 days. That takes you to the time that Messiah is supposed to present himself. And remember, not only does it say that the Messiah would present himself, but it tells us specifically that he'd be rejected and killed. Now in the English translation, it doesn't appear to say that, but if you go back and you read that in Hebrew, there's no question that that's what it's saying. So the words in Hebrew, um, the context tells us what the words say, obviously. But not only do the words give us meaning, the individual letters of the words each have a symbolic meaning. And if you take the context and you take the meaning of the individual letters, there's no question that Jesus died because of a capital offense that he was accused of, that he was innocent of. That's exactly what the New Testament tells us. It tells us that he was accused of blasphemy, and that's why he was killed. The Jews gave him up over to, uh, to Pilate and demanded that he be killed because you know, Jesus claiming to be God was an affront to Caesar who claimed to be a God. That's why Jesus died. People who say that Jesus didn't claim to be God, they're out of their mind. That's the reason why he was crucified. Go back and read your Bible. So when did this decree happen? Well, it happened, we see in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. It happened during the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. Plain and simple. Boom. There you have it. No question whatsoever. Now, we're not going to go through and read through this entire passage, but it specifically tells us that it came about in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of, Artaxer the, of, Ar of King Artaxerxes. And then it goes on through the rest of the book, and it basically tells us Nehemiah's struggles for getting um, the city of Jerusalem rebuilt. You can read the entire book, and it tells you this, all right? Very simple. Now, here's, here's a point that you need to understand. Now, this may sound just like minutia, but it's not. It's really important. If you don't understand this, you, you're not going to get this prophecy right. And you're going to be one of those people that placed the prophecy in the, the wrong year. And those errors compound upon each other. There's tons of errors when you, when you get this date wrong. It's not just a matter of different opinions. There's only one way that everything fits and fits well. All right? So what does it say here? In Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it tells us the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Again, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year. Now, most people read that and just kind of go right through that. But what you need to understand is the Jews had two different calendars. The civil calendar, which is sometimes called the Genesis calendar, and the religious calendar, which is sometimes called the Exodus calendar. 
The Genesis calendar was the original calendar, and it was actually the calendar that Nehemiah was using here when he was dating the year of Artaxerxes' reign. Keep in mind, Nehemiah was a Judean prophet, and that's going to be important here in the next couple of slides. So in these different calendars, they use the exact same months. These months are not Jewish months. They're actually Babylonian months. They're Babylonian words, okay? <laughs> and we'll talk about that. But what you see here is that if you use religious months, the month of Kislev is actually the ninth month of the year. And the month of Nisan is the start of the new year. So if Nehemiah was using the religious calendar, Nehemiah chapter 1 would be referring to the month of Kislev in the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign. One chapter later, five months later, we find ourselves in the month of Nisan, but he's calling that the 20th year of his reign. So if he's using the religious calendar, that would actually make it the 21st month of the reign of Artaxerxes. So clearly, Nehemiah is using the civil calendar. So in the month of, in the civil calendar, Kislev, takes place in the third month of the year, and the month of Nisan occurs in the 20th month, or I'm sorry, the seventh month of the year. So the third month and the seventh month are both in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. That's very, very clear here. Nehemiah is using the civil and not the religious calendar in his writings. So why do the Jews even have two calendars? Well, it's pretty simple. Abraham, these people were the descendants of Abraham. In the book of Genesis, we learn that Abraham and his father were both Chaldean. They came from a city called Ur. A few hundred years later, this city would eventually be at the very heart of the Babylonian Empire. So in a way, you could say the Jews actually were, or the Jewish people were Babylonian. They had the same DNA as the Babylonians did, okay? At this time, at the time of Abraham, Abraham would have learned and used something called the Akkadian calendar. The Akkadian calendar was the precursor of the Babylonian calendar and was the most accurate calendar in the ancient, in, during ancient times. As with the Babylonian calendar, the Bible frequently mentions month, the, the number of the months rather than the names of the month uh, in many places of scripture. It'll say during the first month or the 12th month or whatever, the seventh month. Um, it doesn't always write out the, the words, but when it does, it usually doesn't use Hebrew names for the months. It uses the Akkadian or Babylonian names and not Hebrew names. That's important. So throughout the book of Genesis, we see the calendar that uh, we see that uh, Moses, or rather Abraham and Moses, they were using the Akkadian calendar. By the time you get to Exodus chapter 12, God changes the calendar, and he specifically says that in uh, verses 1 through 2, basically God saying that um, the month of Nisan is going to be the beginning of months for you. Now, when you read Exodus chapter 12, it's talking about the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of first fruits, And it's clearly talking about the month of Nisan. So at this point in time, at the time of the Exodus, Right before the Exodus happened, God said, you know what, I'm going to change your calendar. Now your calendar is going to begin in the month of Nisan. That will be the first month of the religious year for you. Now, it's interesting that the first month of the civil year come, is Tishri, which is a derivative of the word Tishru. In Akkadian, that means beginning or beginnings. There are some scholars like Barton E. Payne that actually argue that the Babylonians also used a fall to fall calendar, but most modern scholars don't believe that. They believe that the Babylonian and Akkadian calendars were spring to spring. So the question is, do we know when Artaxerxes became king? Well, absolutely. There are over 40 astronomical tablets that date different events during Artaxerxes' reign. These ancient clay tablets were written in cuneiform and are incredibly well preserved. Now, when they record the month, day, and year, they record these data as numbers. Now, the tablets also record astronomical positions of different planets, which enables modern scholars to confirm the timing of the tablets using NASA's solar, planetary, and lunar models. 
One tablet in particular, BM3229, states that the timing of the death of the previous king. It clearly indicates that Artaxerxes' father, Xerxes, was murdered by one of his sons. The date clearly corresponds with 465 BC in our calendar, and it also mentions that Xerxes died during the fifth month of the year. So the majority of scholars claim that this happened during the month of Av. So in 465 BC, this, would have, this month would have started on July 20th and would have ended in August 18th. As we saw in previous slides, Nehemiah, who was a member of Artaxerxes' court, said that the 20th year of his reign started before the month of Kislev and continued through the month of Nisan. Again, he was clearly using the Jewish civil calendar. So when we're determining the start of Artaxerxes' reign, it isn't a matter how a 20th century scholar or even a 21st century scholar interpret the biblical text. It's also not a matter of how Babylonians would have reckoned the timing of this reign. What matters is how Nehemiah, a Judean prophet, would have viewed the reign of Artaxerxes when he wrote the book of Nehemiah. It's plain and simple. So there was a famous book that was written in 1951 which challenged the previous paradigm set forth by liberal scholars. What you need to understand is these scholars in times past viewed the Bible as nothing more than a collection of myths and fairy tales. And one of the main reasons for this is as they read through the Bible, their chronologies didn't make sense. They didn't match up with what they expected. So they viewed this as nothing more than a fairy tale. That was until this book was written. So it was called The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings. It was a reconstruction of the chronologies of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. So the author, Professor Edwin R. Thiel, studied the Bible very closely to try to understand why the Bible appeared to have these inconsistencies. And among his findings, he found that the dating inconsistencies were rooted in interpretive assumptions that the liberal scholar, scholars wrongly imposed on the text. The issue was not about how somebody in the 20th century viewed accession in the Bible and these chronologies. It should have been how the Bible's authors would have viewed accession and how they would have written and understood these chronologies. Thiel recognized this fact and imposed an inductive approach in studying these texts. After reviewing the texts, he noticed patterns. What he saw with the Judean Jews is after 841 BC, they applied something that he called the non-accession method of reckoning regional years. And you can read all about that in the links that I provided below. You can actually see the entire book with the first link and in the second link, it provides a summary on Wikipedia so that you can just kind of breeze through and get the main points. So what is Thiel's non-accessional model, and why was it so important? Okay, well, whenever a king died and power transitioned from one leader to the next, the Jewish government officials, historians, and prophets recorded the event in a very specific way. So this is how it worked. The Jewish scholars would view the first year of the reign of the new king to have ended at the end of the calendar year that the previous monarch died in. So this was true whether the monarch died at the beginning of the year or just before the end of the year. So in some cases, the first year of some of these kings might have only lasted a calendar month or even a few weeks. That may seem counterintuitive, but Thiel observed this is exactly the way that the Jewish leaders handled this. He also recognized that the Judean Jews and the two southern kingdoms always used the civil calendar and not the religious calendar when recording their history. And he observed that the Israeli Jews and the northern tribes always used the religious calendar and not the civil. So they both used the non-accessional model of regional accession, but the reality is, is they use different calendars. So Dr. Thiel recognized this pattern through inductive Bible study. So he wasn't trying to impose his bias and how he thought the Jews would have seen accession. He studied the Bible to determine how the Jews viewed regional accession. And then he applied that model to his understanding. 
And when he did this, he was able to correct and fix the perceived inconsistencies in the biblical dating record. Now, he wasn't able to resolve all of the issues. There were few that really confounded him. But what we find is that scholars later on built upon Thiel's work, and they were actually able to resolve these dating issues by recognizing co-regencies that were later discovered. So building on Thiel's work, they were able to completely fix the biblical chronologies. Okay, so there's just one loose end that we need to tie up before we take this in for a landing. And that's regarding Darius the crown prince. You see, Artaxerxes was not first in line to the throne. After Xerxes was murdered, there were several ancient Greek sources that actually suggested that Artaxerxes' older brother became king briefly. Now the problem with this is scholars have never found any Persian tablets or manuscripts that list Artaxerxes' older brother as ever having been recognized as king. The Persian tablets that do exist jump directly from Xerxes to Artaxerxes. So regardless of what the Greek sources claim, there is no Persian evidence that Darius was ever recognized as king. And while this Greek narrative provides an exciting and compelling story of court drama, it contradicts what the Persians said about their own monarchs. And if you really scrutinize these different sources, which I have not, but I've been told that they actually contradict each other on certain details. So while they make a compelling story, that's really all it is. It's a story. The Persian sources say that one of Xerxes' sons killed him. And it's likely that Darius was responsible for that murder and that Artaxerxes had him killed and he ascended to the throne. Okay, so let's wrap this up. So in this slide, I'm going to demonstrate that Artaxerxes' decree took place in 446 BC. Now, some of you are probably familiar with other renderings of this prophecy. And what you're probably saying is, you stupid, stupid man. No, it's 445 BC, or no, it's 444. Well, based on everything that I showed you, I'm going to support this premise of a 446 decree date. And I'm going to prove it right now. So previously, we established that Nehemiah used the civil calendar in his writings. This is really important. So secular scholars view this as proof that the Bible is wrong because it doesn't fit their paradigm. But I am not like a secular scholar. I am not going to impose my own bias and my own views into the text. I'm going to take a chapter out of Thiel's arsenal. And I am going to take an inductive approach, and I'm going to let the text define itself. And I'm going to view this prophecy the way that Nehemiah would have viewed it, not the way that a 20th century scholar would have. So unlike these scholars, I'm going to assume that the Bible is correct, but I'll stick to the 465 time frame. I'll also assume that Tablet BM3229 is correct in saying that Xerxes was murdered by his son during the month of Ab or Av in the July-August time frame in 465 BC. I'm also going to apply Thiel's non-accessional model of regional transition and assume that Nehemiah, as a Judean prophet, would have reckoned that Artaxerxes' first year would have started no earlier than July 20th in 465 BC, and would have ended no later than September 18th in 465 BC. So September 18th was the end of the Jewish civil calendar that year. Again, Nehemiah as a Judean prophet would have been aware of the Judean custom of reckoning regional transition. He clearly used the civil calendar in the text, so there's no reason to believe that I'm wrong in saying this. So the first year 
of Artaxerxes' reign would have been 465. The second year of Artaxerxes' reign would have started in the fall of 465 and would have ended in the fall of 464. So you can say that the second year of Artaxerxes' reign would have been 464. Each subsequent year would have started and ended at the start and end of the Jewish civil calendar for that year. So if you count it out, with 465 being the first year of the reign, the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign would have been 446 BC, and that would have been the timing of this decree, and it would have happened sometime during the month of Nisan in 460, or I'm sorry, 446 BC. Now that we know that the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem happened in 446 BC, we can approximate the start of the month of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. So if we look at this particular website, cgsf.org, we can see that the month of Nisan most likely happened around March 25th and 446 BC in the modern Gregorian calendar. Using March 25th, 446 BC as our starting point for this countdown, let's start the counting. So previously, we established that 69 weeks of biblical years is 173,880 days. Again, this is assuming a 360-day biblical calendar. So in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see evidence that the ancient Hebrews used a 360-day calendar in the Bible. So the biblical calendar is not a true lunar calendar because true lunar calendars actually do not have 360 days. They have on average 29 and a half days. So the Bible use, or the calendar used in the Bible was an approximation. In our modern Gregorian calendar, we measure the calendar year by the amount of time that it takes the Earth to orbit around the Sun one time. And that takes just over 365 days. It actually takes about 365 and a quarter days per year. That extra 0.2425 that we see here in the slide helps us to account for leap years. And we actually just had a leap year earlier this year. So in the month of February, we add an extra day and have February 29th added to the calendar every four years to prevent the calendar from drifting. Now, using our modern solar calendar, 173,880 days is the equivalent of 476 solar years. But you also will have an additional 24 and a half days that you need to account for. So let's get this started. Okay, so two slides back, I referenced the calendar from an organization called cgsf.org. That site is affiliated with a charismatic evangelical Christian denomination called the Church of God. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't posting something from some word cult. I checked out their doctrinal statement, and what I found is that in terms of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, they are more orthodox than most mainline evangelical and Protestant organizations that are out there right now. So they are a credible Christian organization. Now, some of you who are very familiar with the calendars may have been disappointed that I used that website and referenced that calendar. Um, so I wanted to address some of those concerns right now before we get any further. So the biblical calendar has 12 months, 30 days per month, 360 days per year. It is a calendar that is considered to be lunar in a sense, but it's just serving as an approximation. In ancient times, the Jews would use that calendar 
but they would rely more upon actual sightings in the lunar cycle. They would sight the new moon. They would actually sight the full moon. And they would make corrections as needed. Now, it's possible that they might have made other calendar corrections as well, but we just don't know because we have no records about how they did what they did. Now, the modern Jew Jewish calendar is a lot different from the biblical one. It can last anywhere from 353 days to 385 days. So it is filled with many different types of rabbinical calendar corrections, including the application of intercalary months. So what an intercalary month basically is, is on some sort of regular interval, they add a month to the calendar and they do this four times within a 19 year interval. And what this does is it helps to um, correct for the drift that would normally occur in the calendar because the calendar is shorter than our 365 day solar calendar. If you don't do this, the spring months start to drift into the summer and then into the fall and so on. So this fixes the calendar. As I mentioned, we have no physical manuscripts about the ancient calendar, but this modern calendar was actually uh, developed by an individual named Rabbi Hillel II. So this guy lived in the fourth century, not the first century. He wasn't a BC kind of guy. He lived in the fourth century. Now the question is, did he perfectly preserve the ancient calendar? And some will claim this, that he's basing it on oral tradition and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is we don't know for sure. We are trusting that he was merely preserving what was done before. But let's be careful. Let's not elevate extra biblical rabbinical tradition to the level of inspired scripture. The fact of the matter is, is his calendar does not agree with the calendar in the Bible. Now, in spite of all of these different calendar corrections, this calendar still drifts one day every 216 years. So some organizations, including the Church of God, sought to correct for this. And they did this by actually changing the timing of the intercalary months. And the way that they did it actually did a better job than what Hillel did originally. It doesn't drift as much. Now, a lot of folks will look at that and they will almost look at that as heresy. But again, this is just extra biblical tradition and we don't even know that Hillel was correct in what he did. Now, one of the criticisms here is that the Church of God believes that the Passover took place, or rather the crucifixion took place in 31 AD. Now, they are actually on very firm ground in saying that. Now, we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but that's actually exactly what the Bible teaches. So if you look at Luke chapter 3, it tells us the year that Jesus' ministry began. It tells us that it happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, we'll go through that, and I'll show you exactly how to calculate that. But when you look at this, what you'll find is that Jesus' ministry started in 29 AD and it concluded in 31 AD. And I base that upon the Gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John, it tells us that Jesus celebrated three Passovers during his ministry career. One in chapter 2, one in chapter 6, and one in chapters 11 through 19. That was the final Passover where he was crucified. And it clearly states this. So you may look at the fact that this organization was biased in terms of trying to align the calendars, which are uncertain, to scripture, which is not. You may criticize that, but I actually believe that that is the right thing to do. 
they're on solid ground. So now we're finally ready to do the countdown. Again, we need to keep in mind that the timing that we have here really is our best guess. But we are going to use Sunday, March 25th in the Gregorian calendar as the start of the countdown in the year 446 BC. So here's the thing. When we actually count down, we aren't going to actually treat 446 as the first year of the countdown. It's kind of like when you have a baby. You don't say that a baby is one year old when they're born. They're one year old after 365 days, and it's the same thing here. So in this table, all of the gray cells in this figure for all of the rows represent the year of the countdown, either in BC years or AD years. And then the countdown is represented in the white rows. So in the first year of the countdown, is really ca we really count that in the year 445 BC. And then in this chart, we count down 199 years, and that takes us to March 25th to 47 BC. Slide, we're continuing the countdown, but now we're going from year 200 in the countdown which corresponds to March 25th to 46 BC. Now this countdown takes us another 219 years, around 219 years or so, um, to the year uh, 419 in the countdown, which corresponds with March 25th, 27 BC. So we see here that uh, the 476th year of the countdown takes us to March 25th and 31 AD. Now we need to add an additional 24 and a half days, and that takes us to April 18th and 31 AD. So we have a 30 day window for the day of the Messiah's visitation starting at April 18th. Um, and the reason for this window is that we don't know precisely when the decree happened during the month of Nisan um, back in Nehemiah 2. It doesn't specify which day, right? So we have a window. Now looking at the calendar and other clues in the New Testament, we can actually kind of work backwards and find out the precise timing of Palm Sunday and even the precise timing of the decree. So we'll take care of that in the next few slides. So on this slide, we are actually looking at a partial screenshot of timeanddate.com. It is a calendar website, and in this case, we are looking at the year 31 AD in the Gregorian calendar, so the modern Western calendar, from the perspective of Israel. So understand that where you are on the globe is going to determine when you see the different cycles of the moon. One of the things that I like about this website is in addition to giving us the the months and days and the days of the week and all of that in ancient times, but it also gives us the ability to look at the lunar cycles. And we see that the full moon took place on April 26th in 31 AD. Now the day of Passover in 31 AD was likely April 26th. This was the day that Jesus would have been crucified. In a lunar calendar, the full moon takes place either on the 14th or the 15th of the month, and it varies from month to month and year to year. With that in mind, we see that the Passover likely happened on April 26 and 31 AD. So in the previous slide, we were looking at some search results from a calendar website called timeanddate.com. I did a search in the Gregorian calendar 31 AD and I assumed Israel as a geographic reference point for that search. Again, it's really important to make sure that you are using the proper geographic frame of reference because where you are on the globe influences the timing that you would experience these lunar cycles. And what we found from that search is from the perspective of Jerusalem the full moon would have happened on April 26, which would have been a Thursday. 
And I suggested that that was a potential time for the Passover, the time of Jesus' crucifixion. So here's the question. Am I right saying that the Passover took place and that the crucifixion took place on Thursday, April 26, 31 AD? Well, looking at this site, cgsf.org, it indicates that Nisan 14, which is the day of Passover, actually would have happened on a Wednesday and not a Thursday. Now that seems to disagree with what I just said, but what you need to remember is that these calendar websites represent approximations. And what we really should be doing is we should align everything to the Gregorian calendar and the actual timing of these different lunar events. There's a way of demonstrating when these different events happen because NASA, along with the department and the Navy, they both provide very accurate estimates of when these things happen in ancient times. Now you'll remember that I mentioned that cgsf.org disagrees with the official modern Jewish calendar because it seeks to correct drift in the calendar. So the modern Jewish calendar places the Passover during the month of March in 31 AD, while this site places it in April. So which group is right? Well, the Jews will say, well, no, it should have been in March. But here's the thing is, if it's in March, the timing of the Passover doesn't fit the biblical account in the New Testament. It only fits the biblical account in the New Testament if you assume an April time frame. So again, I am not going to elevate rabbinical tradition to a level of inspired scripture. Since the calendars are uncertain, and I would argue as a Christian that the scripture is not, I am going to align the calendars to the scripture and not vice versa. Now, what we'll see in the following site, in the following couple of slides, actually, that the Passover did in fact take place on a Thursday. And we are going to base this on kind of like a virtual sighting of the new moon. Kind of cool. So this is so cool. We are looking at nasa.gov. We are looking at a part of that site that chronicles the phases of the moon in 31 AD. So if we look at this site and we reference the month of April, what we will find is that the, the new moon took place on April 10th, assuming a universal time or a UT time zone. So the universal time zone is two hours behind the Israeli time zone. So while this is saying that the new moon would have happened at 11.32, it actually would have happened at 1.32 p.m. And it indicates that the full moon would have happened um, just before midnight on April 25th. Okay, so keep those time frames in mind as we go to the next slide. The book of Exodus reveals that the Passover happens on the 14th day during the month of Nisan. And it tells us that this is the day that the Passover lambs would be sacrificed. And consequently, this is the day that Jesus was crucified, according to the New Testament. And what I'm going to demonstrate right here and right now is that this happened on Thursday, April 26, contrary to what CGSF org said in the previous slides. So while the astronomical, what I'm going to call secular new moon, would have appeared at one. 32 p.m. on April 10th, 
in Jerusalem, the ancient Jews would have looked for the new moon after sunset. So NASA considers the new moon to have happened when it is completely dark and invisible and it has no bright contours. So the Jews didn't consider the new moon to have happened when the moon was invisible. They based it on lunar sightings. And in the biblical sense, the, moon, the new moon is observed when you see the first silver of the moon and you need to observe it with the naked eye. It is accepted in um, Jewish circles that the earliest that the biblical new moon can be sighted is three days after the NASA secular new moon. Again, another thing to consider is that Jews reckon the day to end at sunset. So to the Jews, they would have considered this timing to be April 13th and not April 12th. So again, at sunset, one day ends and the next day begins. So they would have gone out after sunset to look for the new moon and then they would have found it. And while the calendar date would have indicated April 12th, in the mind of a Jew, it would have actually been April 13th. So if you count forward 14 days from April 13th, that actually takes you to Thursday, April 26th. So it will be at 11.59, just before the transition from April 25th to April 26th. But here's the catch. Again, that takes place after sunset, so the Jews would have interpreted that day as April 26th. So clearly, the Jews would have counted April 26 as the 14th of Nisan in 31 AD. So Jesus would have been crucified on a Thursday. Okay, so the information that we've seen so far tells us that Daniel's prophecy predicts the arrival of the Messiah in 31 AD. Now what's even more important, quite frankly, is that that is the timing that the New Testament teaches. So if you reference Luke chapter 3, John chapter 2, John chapter 6, and John chapters 11 through 19, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now we'll specifically talk about these passages in a few minutes. But for now, just understand that we are on very solid ground saying that the crucifixion happened in 31 AD. It only could have happened in 31 AD, and it's not just because of Daniel's prophecy. Now, in 31 AD, in Jerusalem, the full moon happened on Thursday, April 26. So we're just reviewing. The full moon can be used to approximate the timing of the Passover in any given calendar year. The Bible clearly teaches that the crucifixion happened on the day of Passover, on Nisan 14. In some places in the New Testament, it generically refers to this as the day of preparation. Now, it was the day of preparation for something called the High Sabbath. So Nisan 14 marks the feast of Passover. That is when the Passover lambs would be sacrificed. At sunset, Nisan 14 ends and Nisan 15 begins. Nisan 15 in scripture is celebrated as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a high Sabbath, which means that it is celebrated as a Sabbath regardless of the day of the week that it falls upon. So they would prepare for the Passover meal on the 14th, and they would actually eat the Passover meal on the evening of the 14th, which would have actually been the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jews today, sometimes, and even back then, sometimes generically referred to the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the seven days that followed it as Passover. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually lasted seven days. And sometimes it would be called Passover. So what you need to understand when you look through the New Testament is that you have to take a Jewish perspective. You can't look at it like a 21st century Gentile. You need to study Judaism to understand the feasts and the timing and what people use to refer to these days. Anyways, 
The Bible also reveals that the triumphal entry happened exactly five days before the Passover. Some folks call this Palm Sunday, and in Luke 19, Jesus called this the day of Israel's quote-unquote visitation. Now you can see support for what I just said about this timing in John chapter 12, Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. You can go back and check out those passages on your own, but you'll see that it supports what I just said. April 22nd, 31 AD was Palm Sunday, and that fits Daniel's prophecy. This timing also fits the Jewish calendar as well as can be expected and also the modern Gregorian calendar and the cycles of the moon. Most importantly, it fits every New Testament passage that talks about the start of Jesus's ministry and the final week of his life. So up until now, I've actually shown you about 40 different passages of scripture that sport and align with this prophecy, and they do this perfectly. But there's more, okay? There's a lot more. So what we're looking at here is not a coincidence. We are viewing a prophetic pattern. Okay, so I'm gonna address the elephant in the room. Again, some of you are thinking, you stupid, stupid man. Jesus died on a Friday, that's what my church teaches, right? Well, I can't help what your church teaches, but I'm gonna tell you that it's a tradition and it's not biblical. It's based on a misinterpretation of Luke 23 verses 53 through 56. Now remember what I just told you about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and how that is a high Sabbath. And it's celebrated as a Sabbath regardless of the day of the week. Okay, let's read this. And he took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. It was the preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. If you jump a little bit further into the gospel, you find that they returned on the first day of the week to finish the burial preparations because they were cut off. Sunset was approaching, and they didn't have time to complete the preparation, so they had to return home. That's why they came back on Sunday. The Good Friday tradition ignores the fact that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is always observed as a Sabbath. So on Nisan 14, you have the Passover sacrifice. We're told in scripture that that's when Jesus was crucified, and that he actually died around 3 p.m. A few of his followers, so not the apostles, but other followers, they went to Pilate, received permission to take Jesus' body to bury it so that he wouldn't be thrown in a mass grave. Pilate granted them permission to do this. So they did it, brought him back to a tomb that was, known, that was owned by a Jew named Joseph of Arimathea. Now the women that followed Jesus ran back home, grabbed spices and perfumes, and came back to the tomb, and they were going to prepare Jesus' body for burial, but they didn't have enough time. So they put Jesus' body into the tomb, they wrapped it in linen, rolled the stone in front of the, uh, the tomb, and they all went home. Why? Because sunset was approaching, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now here's the thing, is it was referring to the high Sabbath. Okay, so at sunset on Nisan 14, the day ends, and technically Nisan 15 begins. Nisan 15 marks the Feast of, high, of Unleavened Bread, and it starts at sunset on the day of Passover, like I just said. The Feast of Unleavened Bread in Scripture is celebrated as a high Sabbath, regardless of the day of the week that it falls upon. There are three high Sabbaths mentioned in Scripture, and they mark three of the different feasts. So there's seven feasts that are mentioned in the Old Testament, and this is the first feast that is celebrated as a high Sabbath. It is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
So in 31 AD, Jesus would have been crucified on a Thursday. At sunset, the high Sabbath would have began, and it would have continued until sunset on Friday. So on Friday, you would have had the high Sabbath, and no work would have been permitted. Then at sunset on Friday through sunset on Saturday, the regular Sabbath would have occurred. So it wouldn't have been until Sunday morning that the women would have been allowed to return to the tomb to complete the burial preparations. It's plain and simple. So you see, a Good Friday tradition is not biblical. So earlier in the Gospel account, Jesus claimed that he would spend three days and three nights in the grave. It's right there in scripture. You can read it in Matthew 12, 40. What does it say? Starting in verse 40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monsters, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In this passage, Jesus said that he'd be in the grave for three days and three nights. It's not that difficult. For this to be true, Jesus would have had to have been crucified on a Thursday. If he would have been crucified on a Friday, he would have been in the grave for three days and two nights. And that doesn't fit the biblical pattern, does it? So you have to make a choice. Either the Bible is correct or your tradition is correct. As for me, I believe that the Bible is correct. So I see that the only credible date for the crucifixion would have been a Thursday. So they should call it Good Thursday, but that's not likely going to change. So we've seen compelling evidence that Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy does support a 31 AD timing for the arrival and crucifixion of Messiah. But the question is, while all of these different things seem to align, what we really need to understand is whether or not the New Testament actually tells us when Jesus' ministry career began and when it ended. So does the Bible give us this information? And the answer is absolutely. So you can see this, not in just one passage of scripture, but if you reference Luke chapter 3 along with the Gospel of John collectively. So we find that in Luke chapter 3 that the 15th year of, Art of uh, Tiberius Caesar's reign is when Jesus started his ministry career. If we reference historical records, what we see is Caesar Augustus, the previous Caesar, actually died on August 19th and 14 AD. Interestingly enough, the civil calendar, the civil Jewish calendar, actually ended on August 14th of that year. So Tiberius Caesar actually began his career as Caesar just a few days into the Jewish New Year in 14 AD. So that would extend from 14 AD in, uh, in the summer of 14 AD into the summer of 15 AD. So that'll be important in just a second. Now, if we look at the Gospel of John, it specifically tells us that Jesus celebrated three Passovers during his ministry in John chapter 2, John chapter 6, and between John chapters 11 and, and 19. That's the final Passover of his ministry. Now, some suggest that the Gospel of John in uh, chapter 5 also um, suggests that there may be a fourth Passover, but it doesn't tell us that. It tells us that Jesus was in Jerusalem to celebrate a Feast of the Jews. And if you read John chapter 5 and 6 together, the context doesn't actually lend itself to having a full year pass between those two chapters. It just doesn't fit. So if we apply Thiel's non-accessional model of regional transition, we can do that here. And if we count the spring of AD 51 as year one, and we count 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, that's the first five years, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, that's the first 10 years, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, that is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign. So Jesus's first Passover would have been in AD 29, his second Passover would have been in AD 30, and sure enough, his third and final Passover would have happened in AD 31. So what we're looking at here is it's not a coincidence. It is a prophetic pattern of prediction and fulfillment, and it is evidence, very strong evidence, of the supernatural origin of the Bible. The Bible is not just a collection of stories and myths and legends, but it is the Word of God given to us 
And God proves that word once again through predictive Bible prophecy. So I've demonstrated in this presentation that Daniel's 70-week prophecy predicts that the Messiah would arrive in 31 AD. I base this on a lot of information, but I based it on the assumption that Artaxerxes' first year of his reign would have been in 465, and that the 20th year of his reign would have been in 446. I determined that this would have happened at the earliest on March 25th, 446 BC, and we counted 173,880 days, and that took us to 31 AD, okay? But let's just assume that I was incorrect about what I just told you, and that the correct date for the start of Artaxerxes' reign would have been 464 and not 465. If that's the case, you can use this table, and I've demonstrated that the 20th year of his reign would have fallen in 445 BC. If you look at the calendar in 445 BC, you'll find that Nisan 1 would have happened approximately around April 12th. So assuming that as a starting date, for the count, you count 173,880 days, and that will actually take you to 32 AD in the spring. Now we'll talk about that in the next slide. But for right now, what I wanna address are the folks that believe in a 33 AD crucifixion timing. Now the reason why I do not view this as a credible timing is simple. The folks that believe in this believe that Artaxerxes' first year of reign occurred in 464 BC. And what they simply do is they subtract 20 from 464 and that results in 444. And then they do the calculations based on 444 decree date. Well, as you can see from this table, or even by counting on your thumbs and fingers, that 444 would actually have been the 21st year of the reign. And that's not what Nehemiah said. So based on that, I have to disagree with the folks that believe in a 33 AD crucifixion. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. So I just mentioned that a 33 AD crucifixion timing doesn't really fit the prophecy. Okay? The only way that it fits the prophecy is if you make a mistake when you count. So I'm not going to take a 33 AD crucifixion timing seriously. Furthermore, in another place in the presentation, I demonstrated that there was a way of confirming the timing of the crucifixion. And then when you do that, it verifies that the crucifixion happened in 31 AD. Now, there is a way of looking at the Gospel of John where you can kind of manufacture an additional Passover in Jesus' ministry career. It doesn't really fit the text, but let's just say that, um, that these people are right in manufacturing a fourth Passover during Jesus' career. If that's the case, then it could potentially be a valid date for the crucifixion. So let's just look at 32 AD in the calendar, and we can assume that the Passover either would have happened in March or April. Most folks who believe in this prophecy believe that it would have happened in April. But here's the problem, is if you look at the April calendar, you'll see that the full moon actually happens on a Monday. So again, the 14th of Nisan could have potentially either been Sunday, April 13th, or Monday, April 14th. Those are the only two days that Passover could have taken place in April of 32 AD. Now, if that's the case, the biblical record is wrong, because the biblical record says that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, which would have been a Sunday. So 
Jesus certainly didn't spend over a week in the ground. The Bible said that he spent three days and three nights in the grave. So this clearly doesn't fit the biblical record. And this was the reason why I was so heartbroken the very first time I sought to check this prophecy on my own. I sat down and my intention was to do a blog post that proved Robert Anderson's method. And I was going to use, I had intentions of using calendars and solar records and lunar records and all of this stuff. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to prove the prophecy to strengthen people's faiths. And when I saw this, my heart sank because I saw that the prophecy that really convinced me that the Bible was real wasn't adding up. But the thing is, is I was a believer and I knew that the prophecy had to be correct. So I stuck with it and I spent about an hour kind of looking through my work and what Robert Anderson did. And then I finally realized the mistake that he made in the timing of uh, the decree date. And when I fixed that error, it fixed the pro it basically fixed everything else and the prophecy fit like a charm. Now this may not be important to you because you may be a Christian and you may already be convinced that Jesus is Messiah. But think of this, if I was a Christian and I went through this process and it devastated me, what do you think would happen to a skeptic who heard about the prophecy and wanted to verify that the prophecy was real? They would get to this point and they would most likely stop and they would walk away and they would think that the Bible was false and the prophecy was false and that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. That's why this is so important. Truth is important. So Daniel 9.26 also suggests that the temple would be destroyed and that the nation would be judged. If you remember back to Luke 19, we talked about the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. In that passage, Jesus is basically approaching Jerusalem and he is coming up to the Eastern Gate, but he's still in the distance and he looks upon Jerusalem and he is lamenting. He's sad because that he knows that the Jews will reject him, that he'll die, that he'll die for the sins of the world, and that the nation will be judged. And he talks about it in a great amount of detail. Now, the details that he mentions here in the gospel accounts very closely correlate with historical records um, that were contemporary in 70 AD. So there was a secular Jewish historian, and his name was Josephus, and he wrote a book about this rebellion. So the rebellion started in 66 AD, and it ended in 70 AD with the destruction of the city, the temple, and the people of Jerusalem. And what he, sa what he says is nearly one million men, women, and children in and around Jerusalem were actually killed as punishment for this rebellion. Now in this text, it tells us that Messiah would be cut off and have nothing. So the Messiah would be killed. But it also tells us in rather cryptic language that the people of the prince who was to come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know from history that that people group that destroyed the city and the sanctuary were the Romans. We know that for a fact. That's what his, this historian recorded. Now, when it talks about the prince who is to come, it's actually referring to the biblical Antichrist. Now, what you'll find in this passage is that Daniel's 69 weeks comes to an end. And there's actually a gap. There's a period of time that happened after Messiah was killed and before the 70th week begins. And we'll get to the 70th week in the very next slide. So in the previous slide, we talked about how the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel were not contiguous. 
In Daniel 9.27, this is what it says. And it says, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. One week. Seven years. Okay? But in the middle of the week, he will put stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, a lot of people will go back and say, oh, well, we read about this in the book of Daniel, and it was fulfilled a long time ago. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, is Antiochus Epiphanes did do something very similar to this. But in, in uh, the book of Daniel and in the New Testament, we see that this is actually a future event. Now, in the book of Revelation and the Gospel of Matthew, it talks about the abomination that makes desolation. And it tells us that it will be an event that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And that agrees with the text here in Daniel. So if Jesus said that this was a future event, and John said that this was a future event, and John wrote the book of Revelation in 95 AD, that is when most scholars place the book of Revelation, this couldn't possibly have been referring to an event that occurred in the past. This is a future event, plain and simple. Now it tells us that the Antichrist would make a firm covenant with the many. Many modern scholars believe that the Antichrist will not actually put forth a peace treaty, but he will confirm and make firm an existing regional peace treaty between Israel and its neighbors. Some folks will even tell you that one of the points in the peace treaty will be a concession to allow the Jews to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. Later on in the verse, it talks about the middle of the week. Well, 1260 days into the tribulation period, we are told that the Antichrist will come into the temple and he will desecrate the temple. In the same way that Antiochus Epiphanes did before, he will desecrate the temple and he'll set up the abomination that makes desolation. It says that in the book of Revelation, it says that here, and it says that in Matthew 24, um, specifically verses 15 through 20. So the 70th week of Daniel hasn't started yet. It is a future event. I believe that the rapture of the church will happen sometime before the tribulation period occurs. The Bible makes it very clear that we are as the church, are kept out of the wrath of God. We're taken out of the wrath of God. And that's what I believe. So in Daniel 9, 27, we clearly see that the temple will be rebuilt again, and there will be a temple on the Temple Mount during the tribulation period. That's very important because Many different passages in the New Testament tell us that the temple will be on the Temple Mount during the tribulation period. And all you really need to do is read um, Revelation chapter 11. It specifically tells us that the temple will be there. And I believe in a way God really made it clear that you can't allegorize the temple in that chapter. Because what ends up happening is John is given a, given a measuring rod, and he is asked to measure the dimensions of the physical temple that is on the Temple Mount. And he specifically tells them not to measure out certain sections of the temple because that area was given over to the Gentiles. What you need to understand is on the Temple Mount right now, there is the Dome of the Rock. But it's not in the location that the historical temple sat. So it seems to suggest in the book of Revelation that the, that the Dome of the Rock will still be on the Temple Mount, but that the temple will be a real physical temple which will exist. So right now there is no temple there, but there are plans to rebuild it. There is an organization called the Temple Institute, and they are based in Jerusalem. Right now they have the plans 
the implements and the priesthood trained. They have a temple which was just dedicated back in De December of 2018. They started to dedicate that temple because of excitement that was sweeping Israel back in September. So on September 4th, something happened in Israel that has not happened in 2,000 years. The first ceremonially perfect red heifer was born in Israel on September 4th, 2018. You can read, you can go on the internet, you can see YouTube videos of the little calf and you can read articles about it. What they're basically saying is that this is the 10th perfect red heifer that was born in the history of the Jewish people. And Jewish tradition holds that it's a sign of the Messiah's return. They believe that after the 10th red heifer was born, that the temple would be rebuilt and that the Messiah would come. We're watching this happen in our lifetime. After it turns three, it'll be eligible to be sacrificed. And at that point, it could be used for a future cleansing ceremony so that the temple could be used again. It's not to say that God endorses the building of this temple. The temple is no longer needed because of the sacrifice of Christ. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus sacrificed himself once for all to do away with sin. The temple sacrifices are no longer needed and they're no longer um, endorsed by God. That is why we have not had temple sacrifices for the last 2,000 years is because it has not been needed. But the Jews don't know that. And the Bible says that the Jews will rebuild their temple and they will renew their temple sacrifices and that within the tribulation period, the temple sacrifices will occur up until the 1260th day of the tribulation. Three and a half years into the tribulation, the temple sacrifices will cease. And that is what we saw in the book of Daniel. That is what we see in the book of Matthew. That is what we see in the book of Revelation. We see these things taking place right in front of our eyes. It's not to say that the tribulation period has started because it clearly has not. It is a future event. But what we see right now is stage setting. God is preparing things for all of these prophecies to be fulfilled within a seven year period. We see this happening today. The time is drawing near. I'm going to wrap things up here in the next few slides. We're going to jump over to Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to look at the first few verses. And what it says here is, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. It's referring to the Jewish people. It's not referring to Christians here, okay? Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, some to everlasting life, but to others, disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heavens, and those who lead the many to righteousness, so people who are preaching the gospel like stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So what is he saying here? He's saying, Daniel, you know, I've given you this book of prophecy, but you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand very much of it. But at the end of time, at a point in time when people are traveling like they never traveled before, and after a period of time where knowledge has greatly increased, at that point, people will understand. Those are the times that we live in today. So I'm sure that there's some people out there that would view all of this information and file it away as being interesting. And what they would say is, well, that's well and good. But didn't Jesus die 2,000 years ago, and didn't he say that he was coming back soon? Well, let's go to 2 Peter 3 and see what Peter had to say about this, because he actually prophesied that these very things would be said in the future. He said this, knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Jumping down to verse 8, it says this, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Yes, it's been nearly 2,000 years, but the reality is, is obviously, the church is not finished yet. The age will not end until the last church saint is saved. When that happens, at God's discretion, the age will end, and the rapture of the church will take place, and shortly after that, according to what the New Testament teaches, the tribulation period will begin, and God's focus will shift off of the church and onto, re onto the redemption of Israel. And at that point, people who are left behind will have the option to believe in Christ and his gospel, and many will be saved during that tribulation period, but the majority of people will not. That's what the Bible teaches in the New Testament. So yes, I agree, it has been a long time. But there's a reason for this delay. And some have actually suggested that in different places in the Old Testament, it actually does predict that this delay would actually occur. You only need to go as far back as the book of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37 and 38 and 39. It predicted the resurgence of the nation of Israel, really the rebirth of Israel as a nation. It speaks of Israel coming back to the land after being gone for a very, very long time, and that they'd come back to a land that was desolate, and that they would build that land back up and become very prosperous. And by the time you get to chapters 38 and 39, it presents Israel as being so prosperous that Israel's neighbors coveted their wealth. And it speaks of a confederation of nations that would actually attack Israel from the northern kingdom, from the north of the kingdom. If you look back at the tribal names that it describes in this passage of scripture and study those names using Genesis chapter 10 and referencing some books that were written back in ancient times, Josephus's um, Antiquities of the Jews, what you'll find is that the nations that are mentioned there are none other than Russia, modern-day Iraq, Turkey, and a confederacy of nations that are all Muslim today. And what do we see? We see in the north, to the north of Israel today, that Syria is in a state of shambles, and we see Iran, Russia, and Turkey and all of these different nations, people from all of these different nations in that area right now. So yes, I agree that it's been a long time, but there are many prophecies that are converging today that could not have been fulfilled at any other point in history. Never in history has Russia, Iran, and Turkey had the relationship that they have. No other time in history until recent times has Israel even been back in the land. They needed to be back in the land before these end times prophecies could be even fulfilled. So if you are doubtful about the integrity of God's word and his prophetic word, I would suggest that you dig a little deeper. So just over two hours ago, I began this presentation with four questions. I think it's only fitting to end the presentation with a fifth. What will you do with this information? In this presentation, I demonstrated that God said that the way that we should authenticate his prophets and their message 
this predictive prophecy. I believe it's the greatest proof of God's existence. And it's a tool that can strengthen the faith of many believers. In the presentation, we saw that roughly 27% of the Bible is considered predictive prophecy. So at the time of the writing of these verses, it was predicting the future in advance. The Bible makes 1,817 specific predictions on 737 different matters in the Old and New Testament. Many of these prophecies are messianic and speak of the two comings of the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I mentioned that Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy is the reason why I am a Christian today. When I first learned of it, I found the evidence to be too compelling, and it proved to me the supernatural origin of the scriptures, and opened me up to the possibility that Jesus could, in fact, be the Messiah. So Daniel's prophecy predicts the coming of the Messiah to a 30-day window in April of 31 AD. When using other scriptures, we can narrow that window to April 22nd, 31 AD for Palm Sunday. And we find that the crucifixion date was April 26, 31 AD. In addition, the same passage predicts that shortly after the Messiah's death, that the city and the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed and the Jewish nation would be made desolate. It also implies that just before the end of the age, before the tribulation period begins, that the temple would be rebuilt and that midway through the seven year tribulation period, that the temple would be desecrated by a political figure that we've come to know as the Antichrist. Now the Bible states that all of these truths that Daniel shared with us would be concealed until the end of the age. It really wasn't until Robert Anderson in the 1800s that anybody even understood this passage of scripture. Many people tried to understand it, but everybody failed to explain it properly. Now, Robert Anderson, God bless him, did make some mistakes. And he made those mistakes because of the era in which he lived. He didn't have access to the technology that we do today and didn't have the ability to check his work. But one thing is clear, is that the Bible says that these truths would be concealed until the time of the end, and that people would start to understand these truths during a time when knowledge would greatly increase and people would be capable of traveling like they never did before. So it's not me that's saying these things. Modern biblical scholars that have studied these passages have demonstrated all of these things that we talked about today. So I ask you again, what will you do with this information? Jesus the Messiah came to die for your sins. And the Bible says that he is the only way to heaven. He is the only way back to the Father. The New Testament and the Old Testament both support that our salvation is not through our works, but it's through faith. It's in faith alone in Christ alone. I would suggest that if you need more information, that you go to my blog site. It's called The Narrow Gate and Way blog, and it is part of the blogger network. But more importantly, I would encourage you to find a good Bible and sit down and read it and study it for yourself. 
read the Gospel of John and read the book of Romans. If you understand those two books of the Bible, you will understand the Christian faith. And the Bible promises that if you believe in your heart, in the biblical Christ and in the biblical gospel, that he will save you. It is not your works that save you. It's your faith. And your faith is built by studying the scriptures. So I thank you for your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions or concerns.